Well, let's just get the elephant out of the room. I broke it. It is not due to my age. And we won the game. <laughs> uh, I go down on Sunday nights and play rec with the guys and a few ladies as well uh, at Andreasen. And uh, two Sunday nights ago, came down on someone else's foot and rolled it over and snap, crackle, pop. And here we are. So now that we have acknowledged this boot, you will not be distracted by it at all for the remainder of this presentation this morning. So. And to help you in that effort, uh, doesn't the sanctuary look nice? Stage up here looks nice. Yes, uh, William and uh, William is head of our uh, maintenance here at, at Pioneer, and uh, he and his team did a great job. I think it looks very, very good. Uh, I think there's even some more decorations that are coming in the future. Tis the Christmas season here at Pioneer. This is indeed part three of our series. This is the final installment of our series entitled "The Holy Hurricane." And, and as we begin, I want to do a, a, an advertisement here. If you do not have this book, The Coming of the Comforter by Leroy Froome, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you get it. Uh, it is one of the best summations of the Bible's teaching on the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does, as well as on the former and latter reigns. And if you would like to know more about those things, this is an excellent book. You can go to Adventist Book Center online. Uh, you have copies there. They'll ship it to you. It is an excellent, excellent read, and I highly recommend that you add this to your library. You know, what we cover in this series, I mean, we, we cover a fair amount, but it, it's just scratching the surface of what the Holy Spirit longs to do in and through us. So please, looking for some good reading, this is a great place to find it. Now, in this series, we have obviously been talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And in part two, we talked about something called the latter reign of the Holy Spirit, the final global outpouring of God's Spirit on His people. Now, if you missed parts one and two, I'm not going to do much review of it here today. I'm going to invite you to go and go to pmchurch.org. You can find those things archived, the previous presentations. Let me just say this. The latter reign of the Holy Spirit, as we discussed last time, will be incredible. It will be an amazing time to be alive. It will bring all other blessings in its train. Miracles will happen. The dead will be raised. And most importantly, the gospel of Jesus Christ will go to the world. Thousands upon thousands will be converted in a day. And at last, Jesus Christ will return. That's going to be awesome. That, it, it will be an incredible time to be alive. But as was pointed out at the end of part two... We will not receive this great blessing of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit unless we are prepared to receive it. There is a qualitative difference and a substantive difference between the former reign, receiving it, and receiving the latter reign. How can we receive the global final outpouring of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit? Well, time is short, and not just for this planet, but for this sermon, so let's get right to it. Though some people may consolidate them differently than I'm going to here this morning, I would suggest that there are four steps to receiving the global outpouring of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. Now, steps one and three are to be done personally. Steps two and four are to be done together, corporately with fellow believers. And all together, these four steps will create the right conditions for God to send the global latter reign of His Holy Spirit. Here are those steps. Step number one, to receive the global latter reign of the Holy Spirit, we must personally, daily receive the former reign of the Holy Spirit. Now, no surprises there, right? I mean, as we discussed previously, the former and the latter reigns are sequential. One follows the other. The former reign must come first, and then and only then comes the latter reign. Now, uh, those of you that were here in part one, how do you receive the former reign? How do you receive the initial filling of the Holy Spirit? That's right, you ask for it. I heard somebody say it. You ask for it. Luke 11, Jesus says, you know, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, even though you're evil, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? And so, 
in asking for that, we are giving permission and we participate in letting the Spirit begin His work in our lives, and the latter rain will not come unless we are experiencing the former rain. Now, Ellen White, Testimonies to Ministers, page 506 and 507, she put it this way. She says, the latter rain, ripening earth's harvest, represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. That's Jesus. But unless the former rain has fallen, there will be no life. The green blade will not spring up. Unless the early showers have done their work, the latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. And get this, this, this is astonishing. Without the former rain, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. That's astonishing. I mean, the latter rain, as we read last time, it, it will be an incredible time to be alive. And to think that if we are not receiving the former rain, we won't even recognize it? You know, the only thing that I can figure is, is that it's not that we won't see activity happening around us. Oh, we'll see that, conversions and miracles, etc. But because the Spirit of God is not inside of us, we will attribute it to the dark side. We will not recognize it as the work of God, but rather we'll claim it's the work of Satan because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Exactly. So we must be receiving the former reign of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. This needs to be a personal daily experience. That's step one. Step two is one that we are to do together and to find out what it is. We need to, again, think logically about what we have learned from the Bible about the former and the latter reigns. So, the former and the latter reigns of the Holy Spirit on a personal level are two distinct phases of spiritual growth. There's the first initial spiritual development, and second, there is a spiritual maturation, this, this growing to maturity in Christ. Similarly, the former and latter reigns on a global level are two distinct phases of the global work, not of an individual, but of the church. The initial development of the church's work starting in Acts chapter 2, that was recognized as the former reign of the Holy Spirit, and the completion of its work in the latter reign as seen in Revelation 18 and elsewhere. But notice carefully, both of these phases whether personally or corporately, doesn't matter, are still phases of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Spirit is not absent from one but present in the next or vice versa. Instead, it is one and the same Holy Spirit working in both and therefore it follows that. Let me just put it on the screen here for you. The ways that God's people prepared themselves for the former reign at the beginning of the church's work, Acts chapter 2, are some of the same ways God people should prepare for the latter reign at the end of the church's work. We are to be looking to be filled with the same Spirit in both reigns, and we can therefore prepare to receive those reigns in some of the same ways. For instance, take a look at Acts chapter 1, please. Acts chapter 1. Page 733 in most of your pew Bibles there. Page 733, Acts chapter 1, verse 12. One of the ways that God's people prepared for the former reign prior to Pentecost stands out really more than, than, than any other, and that's what we're looking for here. Let me set the scene. If we were to read earlier in Acts chapter 1, uh, Jesus has just, just literally just returned back to heaven. Angels have appeared. They've told the disciples, you know, this, this uh, same Jesus whom you saw go up into heaven will come in like manner back down. Uh, and then the disciples go to Jerusalem because Jesus said, wait, wait for the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And that's what they do. Verse 12, Acts chapter 1. Then they, the disciples, returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. Notice verse 14. They all joined together Interesting choice of words there. They all joined together constantly in prayer. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And just to get an idea of how big this group was, verse 15, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. Hmm. The second step to receiving the global blessing of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit is this, united 
persevering prayer. United, persevering prayer. Now, again, this shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Again, Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, you know, if, if you know how to get good gifts, God can give good gifts too. But what we didn't point out previously is that it doesn't specify which reign this works for. It just works for the outpouring of the Spirit, either in the former or the latter reigns. And we must ask for it. We need to ask for both. You know, Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1 actually is pretty explicit about this. It says, ask the Lord for the rain in the springtime. Is that the former or the latter rain? That's the latter. That's the latter rain here. Now the context there is agricultural. But if, it's, if that was to help the agricultural latter rain in a farmer's field, how much more for the field of the Lord? Let us ask specifically and frequently for the former and for the latter rains of the Holy Spirit. And do it by name. And notice those two things. The disciples had prayer, but they did it united, and they persevered in doing it. And if we wish to receive the global blessing of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit in our day, we need to do the same. So let me ask all of us two simple questions. Number one, are we asking for the latter reign of the Holy Spirit in a united fashion? You say, well, what do you mean? Well, certainly united has at least the connotation of, of, of geography, right? Of being in the same place. The disciples all gathered together there, and while undoubtedly there was individual prayer happening throughout the, the many days that they were in that upper room, they, they were also praying together as a group. Are we doing that? You know, a week and a half or two weeks ago, we, we had an opportunity over at the seminary. You know, some of our seminarians there planned a, a special week dedicated to asking for the blessing of the Holy Spirit. You know, did you attend that? Did you, were you part of that? Every week... Every week of the year on this campus, there are, there are small groups of people that gather and they pray regularly and specifically for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Are you a part of one of those groups? History is replete with examples of how God has, has given special recognition when His people gather together as groups. I mean, and this is even more than just, you know, where two or three are gathered together. There, there the presence of the Lord is. There's something special when God's people gather together and they are asking, they're pleading for God to do the same thing, including the outpouring of His Holy Spirit. You know, if you're not a part of a group like that, I would just encourage you to, to, to either join one of the existing ones or to make one yourself. This, this is not, it's not complicated. This is not difficult. You don't need me to hold your hand to do this. You can do this. Ask somebody, hey, let's get together, and then let's ask somebody else. To, we're going to pray for this on a regular basis, asking for the blessing of the Holy Spirit in His latter rain power to come. And a second question for you. Are we praying for the Holy Spirit while being united in our hearts? You know, earlier in the gospel accounts, if we were to read there, we would find very quickly that the disciples were famous for their disunity, their bickering and their fighting. You know, who's the greatest? Who does Jesus love more? You, me, no, it's me, no, it's me. You know. But in the days in the upper room in Jerusalem, at last they set their differences aside. They were united in Christ. How about you? Are you united in heart with your fellow believers. You know, it is a sad fact. We all know this to be true, that there are some churches, present company accepted. We're all okay. But I've heard that there are some churches where people can be sitting shoulder to shoulder and yet miles apart. Are you united in heart with your fellow believers? Let me put 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13 up here on the screen. The Holy Spirit is all about this unity. It says the body, speaking of a person's physical body, is a unit, though it is composed of many parts. And although its parts are many, they all form one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and were, we were all given one spirit to drink. One body, God says. One body, the Spirit says. What is separating you from your fellow believers right now? If there is something, what is it that is separating you from them? And here's the key question. Is that division worth stopping the outpouring of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit? 
Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 175. Spirit of Prophecy says this. When the laborers have an abiding Christ in their own souls, when all selfishness is dead, when there is no rivalry, no strife for the supremacy, when oneness exists, when they sanctify themselves so that love for one another is seen and felt, then the showers of the Holy Spirit will just as surely come upon them as that God's promise will never fail in one jot or tittle. But when the work of the others is discounted, that the workers may show their own superiority, they prove that their own work does not bear the signature it should God cannot bless them. And that last sentence is specifically talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. Ladies and gentlemen, as a fellow traveler with you, I would plead with all of us to hear it and to hear it well. If there is something that is separating you from your fellow believers, the source of that separation had better be from God. It had better be clearly evidenced in His Word and clearly in accordance with His will. For if it is not, for God's sake, proper use of the phrase, for God's sake, let go of it. Get rid of it. Be reconciled. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to each other. This unity requirement is not a joke. This is for real. The latter rain depends upon it. God is waiting, so hold on to Christ, and as far as it depends on you, be united with the rest of his family. That's unity. What about perseverance? You know, the disciples prayed for the outpouring of the former reign of the Holy Spirit for days on end. Can the same be said of us with regard to the latter reign? You know, we get tired pretty easily, don't we? We identify a little too closely with the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. Watch and pray. Oh, Lord, we're going to walk. It happens way too often. We grow weary of talking with Jesus. Yet if we persevere in praying, particularly for the latter reign of the Holy Spirit, it will come. Review and Herald, March 19, 1895. She says, the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the church is looked forward to as in the future, but it is the privilege of the church to have it when? Now. Now, if, if, if then now now was, was now, how much more is now now now? Okay. Today, seek for it, pray for it, believe for it. We must have it, and heaven is waiting to bestow it. That sounds like perseverance to me. Seek for it, pray for it, believe for it. If we are to receive the global outpouring of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit, we must have united, persevering prayer. That's step number two. Step number three. The third step to receiving the global blessing of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit is this. Fully cooperate with Jesus as he takes the work of the former reign and brings it to maturity through the latter reign. Fully cooperate with Jesus as he takes the work of the former reign and brings it to maturity through the latter reign. In step two, we asked for the latter reign to come. In step three, we live out that request. And let's be even more specific here. The latter reign takes what was started in the former reign and brings it to maturity. We've seen this multiple times now, both in the Bible and elsewhere. So what was the work that Jesus wanted to do in us through the former reign that he will now carry to maturity in the latter reign? Well, you might remember, we made a list. We put down seven different things that the Spirit begins to do in us. Let me just remind you what those things were. In the beginning, the Spirit convicts us of our sins, uh, takes Christ's resurrection power, applies it to our lives, teaches us all things, reminds us of Christ's Word, guides us into all truth. He begins to tell us what is to come in the future. This is prophecy. And lastly here, He begins to transform us into courageous, faithful, powerful, and passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a great start. This is the work that Jesus does through His Spirit, through the former reign. And then, if we want to receive the global blessing of the latter reign, 
We must commit personally to living out the work of the former reign of the Spirit to the point of maturity to have Christ fully formed in us. Now, does that make sense? Okay, I see some heads nodding. All right. Let me, let me put a little more meat on these bones. Uh, vegan, vegan meat, of course, yes. Right. Now, what might this living out of the work of the former reign into the latter reign maturity look like? Let's get, let's get very specific here. Uh, let's go back to our list, okay? So it begins here. In the beginning, the former reign of the Holy Spirit begins to convict us of our sins. Now, now this is often uh, kind of a general sense. Many of you, if you look back at your conversion experience, you can relate to this. There was a general sense you see in the rearview mirror, the Holy Spirit giving this to you, that your life is not right. There, there are sins. There, there, there's darkness in your life. You are out of step with God, and it brings you to the point of initial repentance. And then there is this, you know, this initial growth that takes place. This is part of the former reign of the Holy Spirit. Now, if we are going to participate in the latter reign in this regard, we now need to let the Holy Spirit move beyond that initial conviction of sin and into every corner of our lives to convict us of any remaining sin in our lives. This is what the Bible calls sanctification. You know, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10, we're not going to look it up here. Let me just share it with you. It says that the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And if the Holy Spirit can search out the deep things of God, how much more can He root out willful sin from our lives? You know, Jesus, through His Holy Spirit, is the greatest soul surgeon who ever lived. I mean, I mean He wrote the book on it, right? I mean, He knows how to do this. He is on your side, and He has never lost a case. So to participate in the global latter rain experience, let his loving, searching eye of his Holy Spirit convict you of the cancer of sin wherever and whenever it is found in your life. And as we mentioned in part one, you don't have to be afraid of this process. God is not looking to crush you. He is looking to save you. Let me give you an illustration of what this is like. Many years ago, I was 10, 12 years old, something like that, and it was a, a beautiful, sunny, Sunday, Central California day. There was nothing much to do. I was bored, and so was my friend David. Uh, he lived just down the street from me. We were just kind of hanging out, wondering what to do, uh, when David had an idea. He said, hey, Shane, let's go play darts at my house. All right, fine. Ride our bikes down to the street to his house, go into his garage, get the darts out. Foom, foom, foom. We'd played darts before. This really wasn't terribly engaging, right? And, and we're kind of losing interest pretty quickly when, when David has a bright idea. Hey, Shane, what if we went outside and we found different targets for our darts? What if we found things that a dart would stick into and we saw how far away we could get and still hit the target? This was an awesome idea. And so we went, I, you know, I grabbed my three darts and put it in my pocket. He grabbed his three darts, put it in his pocket. We got on our bikes. We rolled back down to my house and we began to find and destroy targets. We had these little saplings out, you know, five or six of them on the side of our house at that time. And uh, they're only about this big around. And so we would get like 10, 12 feet back and, and would throw a dart. And the idea is if you stuck it in the tree, you had to step two steps back, right? So pretty soon we're back far enough. Can't hit that one. Lose interest. What else could we hit? Well, I had this fence. It was, it was fairly, if I remember right, it was fairly recently painted. So I know my stepdad really enjoyed what was happening out here. We would stand back on the sidewalk and say, okay, I'm going to hit that one that's got the knot hole in it. Okay, I'll go for that. We'd step back. We actually got all the way across the street. I mean, this is like 60 feet away, okay? Throw it, chuck in these darts, and you know, boom, in the side of the fence there. But even throwing darts from 60 feet can get boring after a while. And after about half an hour of throwing darts hither and yon, I said to David, hey, here's your darts. Let's go find something else to do. So we go around to the front of my house. And I'm, just, I'm sitting there actually on his bike. Sometimes we would switch bikes. And I was sitting on his bike. And David has great idea number three. He didn't tell me about it. He decided 
that from where he was standing, he was going to try to put a dart in the post that held up my family's mailbox. Okay. You know, it's four by four post. You've probably you know, you've seen these things. It's on the, right there on the curb. And he thought to himself, this is a great idea. He's like 25 feet away. And so he eyes it up there with a dart, right? And he winds up and he throws this thing. And he missed that thing by a country mile and stuck it right in my knee. You see, my leg was propped up here, the top tube of his bike, just sitting here minding my own business. I was about two feet away from, from the mailbox. And this is a thunk right into my knee. Now, this was not a soft tissue injury. This was like into cartilage, right? It was like that, about that far in, I don't know, half inch, pushing three quarters, right? And at this moment, I had two choices that I could make. I could choose to remove the dart or option B, I could pretend that it wasn't there. I could, for instance, I mean, what, what if I did that? What if I had, you know, taken off my light jacket and, and, and put it over my knee? Nothing to see here. <whistles> right. Uh, what if my mother had come by and said, I'm fine, Mom. Why aren't you bending your knee? You see, I actually tried to bend my knee right away, and I discovered really quickly that my skin was moving at a different rate than whatever it was stuck into, right? So I had to have my leg cocked like this. And so I, I, if I had hopped into the house and said, it's, it's fine, Mom. Everything is totally fine, Right? And what if mom suspected something and we went to the doctor and, and by now I had found kind of a, maybe a large plastic cup that you couldn't see through, you know, a darkened cup here, and put it over the dart and the doctor says, oh, son, uh, do you think I could have a look at that? No, 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 everything's fine, it's fine, don't worry about it. I know exactly what you would have thought about that young man. You would have looked at him and said, Genius. This kid is brilliant. Look at what he's doing, hiding this dart on his leg like that. This is, this is, this is top shelf behavior. No, you would have said, this kid's as dumb as the post that David missed when he threw the dart, right? How, who would do this? Who would possibly try to hard this dart sticking out of their knee? Only a fool would try. The sin in my life or yours, in the eyes of heaven, is every bit as obvious as a dart sticking out of the side of your knee. And if you try to cover it over, to put your jacket over the top so no one will know in heaven, the only person you're fooling is yourself. And let me play it out just a little bit further. If I had tried to hide that dart, it would have messed my life up. I mean, truly, think about this. What if I had actually done this crazy thing and tried to hide it and never get it out? I couldn't run. I couldn't play. It would be difficult to get to school and back and forth, certainly like, not like I had been. I probably actually wouldn't be sitting here right now, would I? Because when you leave stuff in that ought to be out, it will mess you up. When the Holy Spirit in the latter rain goes looking to convict you of your sin, He is not looking to harm you, but to heal you. He is looking to get the dart out of your knee. So cooperate. Let Him into every nook and cranny of your life because every conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit is an invitation to participate in the next part of Christ and the Spirit's work, which is, as we saw on our list here, takes Christ's resurrection power and applies it to our lives. This is such incredibly good news. If the Holy Spirit in the former reign begins this second step, begins to apply this in our lives, then in the latter reign, we need to let the Spirit into every corner of our lives. What was in the former reign an initial dip into the process of becoming more like Jesus, again, what the Bible Bible calls sanctification, now in the latter rain, go for full immersion. Dive in. Again, the latter rain is, is intended to bring deep and profound, profound conviction of sin, for sin harms us and it must be removed. But the Bible is clear. Romans chapter 5, verse 20, many of you have memorized this, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. 
Christ, through his Holy Spirit, can bring you victory over every willful sin, transforming you by his grace. Christ, through his Holy Spirit, can bring previously unimaginable power to bear against the sinful habits that may have held you back for years. And this is not true because I say so. It is true because God says so. Let me just put it up here for you to see. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to, to what? To completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at this. Jude, verse 24. Jesus is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you unblemished in his glorious presence with great joy. How about this from Romans chapter 8? What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What's the answer to that question? No one. No one can be. If God is for us, who can be against us? No one can. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him freely give us all things? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justified. Who is there that condemns us? For Christ Jesus, who died and more than that was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and he is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'll tell you what. It's no wonder to me that some, some quotations from the spirit of prophecy came out. I, I have no wonder at all why Ellen White said the following. Look at this. Uh, this is from Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 124. She says, there is nothing that Satan fears so much. Stop right there. I like that. I get tired of living in a world full of fear, don't you? Wouldn't it be nice to see the enemy getting a taste of his own medicine? All right, here it is. There is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church. Every temptation, every opposing influence, whether open or secret, may be successfully resisted, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Ah! There's so much more to be said about this. What Jesus began through the former reign, he longs to and is able to complete through the latter reign. We serve such a good God. You know, we're going to talk more in the future about righteousness by faith because really that's what we're talking about right here. But until then, remember at least this. Without God, you can't. Without you, God won't. But with you and God together, all things are possible. I, I can't help but put one more thing up here for you. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's what it says. There is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. And by the power of his spirit living in you, you can be set free. There's so much more we could say about the list that we had up there. Let's go at lightning speed here. The Holy Spirit in his former reign uh, began to teach us all things. So in the latter reign, Jesus invites us to forsake any and all other teachers that would lead us away from him. In the former reign, the, the Spirit begins to remind us of Christ's words. So in the latter reign, let us let the Spirit make Christ's words an integral part of us, not merely something external, but the very fabric of our hearts. In the former reign of the Spirit, he began to guide us into all truth. So in the latter reign, let us live in that truth. The truth is not a destination. It is intended for our transformation. Uh, the Holy Spirit in the former reign began to tell us what is to come in the future to, to bring us the, to the attention of prophecy. So in the latter reign, let us take what we've heard and study it. Study carefully, persistently, relentlessly what is to come in the future. The Christian who does not take Bible prophecy seriously, particularly in these last days of earth's history, is resisting one of the major purposes of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And lastly... The Holy Spirit and the former reign began to transform us into courageous, faithful, powerful, and passionate followers of Jesus Christ. So in the latter reign, this identity is made to endure. It is made to last, to become permanent. Under the power of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit, courage for Christ, faithfulness to Christ, the power of Christ, the passion for Christ, cease to be flashes of brilliance that may fade with our moods and emotions, and they instead become an unwavering way 
of life. They become not just things we do, but rather they become who we are. Step three to receiving the final global blessing of God's Holy Spirit is to live the latter reign experience. Fully cooperate with Jesus as he takes the work of the former reign and brings it to maturity through the latter reign. That's step number three. Final step number four. The fourth step to receiving the global outpouring of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit is found in at least two texts. The first one here, let me put on the screen. Matthew 24, verse 14, Jesus is speaking. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Jesus here is foreshadowing our day. There will come a time when no longer there will be huge pockets of people that have never heard the name of Christ. Jesus knows that that cannot stand. If he's going to come back and if it's going to be a fair ball game, everybody needs to have a chance to hear. And so there will come a time when the gospel goes everywhere There's another text we've already seen that talks about this as well. Revelation 18, verse 1. After this, John says, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. The entire planet is lit up. Now, as we read further in this, in parts 1 and 2, we discovered this is the gospel going out. God is calling people to make a decision for or against him. This is the good news of Jesus that's being foreshadowed here in Revelation 18, verse 1. And because this is the final great work, The spreading of the gospel, the fourth step to receiving the latter rain is crystal clear. Here it is. If you want to receive the global latter rain, a majority of the church must deeply engage in sharing Christ with others. A majority of the church must deeply engage in sharing Christ with others. In other words, we get things started... And the God of the universe will recognize that fact by sending a massive outpouring of his Holy Spirit. Um, Last day events, page 193, she says this, The great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with his glory, so Revelation 18, we're in the same place, will not come until we have an enlightened people that know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. When we have entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of His Spirit without measure. But this will not be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God. Evangelism, page 699, she says this, the disciples just prior to Pentecost, okay, Acts chapter 2, did not ask for a blessing for themselves. They were weighted with the burden of souls. The gospel was to be carried to the ends of the earth and they claimed the endowment of power that Christ had promised. Then it was that the Holy Spirit was poured out and thousands were converted in a day. And finally, Testimonies, volume 8, page 21. Let Christians put away all dissension and give themselves to God for the saving of the lost. Let them ask in faith for the promised blessing and it will come. You know, the message to me, therefore, is crystal clear. Jesus has already long ago given us the joy and the duty of sharing him with others, right? I mean, this is great commission territory. This is not new. I mean, Matthew 28, 18 to 20 has been around for a long time. And at the end of time, This joy and duty of sharing Christ with others is to go global. No nation, group, or people is to be missed. The Holy Spirit, get this, the Holy Spirit is not going to perform a duty for us that we have not already started ourselves. So let us get to work. Let us go. And as we go, God will send the final fuel of His latter rain to spur us on to victory. You know, we talked about this a couple months ago. Every last one of you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're hearing my voice right now, every last one of you has at least one spiritual gift and I've never met someone who doesn't have more than that. God has given you talents and gifts and abilities and resources. He, he has put you in certain places. He put you, your, your apartment in certain neighborhoods. He's having you take certain classes and, and being in a certain occupation so that he will have a witness for him in that place. Not a single one of you doesn't have what it takes to share Jesus with somebody else. If Jesus lives within, there you go. You've got everything you need to get started. So find it. Find some way that fits you, how God has gifted you and wired you up to share the good news with other people. And when the majority of the church is doing that, great things are going to happen. Four steps. Receiving the global outpouring 
of the latter rain of the Holy Spirit of God. What a time that's going to be. And do you see, do you see what the Holy Spirit is doing here? In the former and the latter rains, the, the Holy Spirit, perhaps we could put it like this. The work of the latter rain, the Holy Spirit in it, is, is weaving. He is weaving Christ's righteousness into us personally. He, he is weaving Christ's righteousness into others through us. He is weaving his people into something. Well, what word can we use? He, he is weaving his people into something that is normal. Did you hear what I said? Normal. You say, well, we'll hold the whole time out. Pastor Shane, we've been talking about the latter end. It's going to be an incredible time. I mean, that's, that's not normal, right? You tell me. Let me put the list back up here. Four steps to receiving this personal global, uh, global latter rain of the Holy Spirit. Personally, daily receive the former rain of the Holy Spirit. United, persevering prayer. Fully cooperate with Jesus as he takes the work of the former rain, brings it to maturity through the latter rain. A majority of the church must deeply engage in sharing Christ with others. What in there is different than the normal Christian should be according to God? Could it be that in waiting to pour out the latter rain of the Holy Spirit, God is just waiting for someone to be normal. Just be normal. The latter rain does not call for super Christians. It calls for Christians. And did you know that there have been at least two times in the Seventh-day Adventist Church's history when we were almost normal? You may not know this, and I'm not going to spend much time here, but just very briefly. 1844, just after it, sometime when you have some spare time, read Evangelism, page 695. And we have been, in quotes, the time, unquote, of the latter reign, according to the spirit of prophecy, since 1888. You can see five manuscript release, 151, letter 230, 1908, for instance. It is almost as though... The Holy Spirit has many times been standing on the edge of heaven, leaning out over the edge, waiting, longing to come, ready to come, but so far has been held back. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what will history say about those of us that are listening to this right now? That we almost received the latter rain of the Holy Spirit or that we did receive? The choice is ours. I pray the answer is the second option. May God richly bless us as the Spirit weaves us to be fully awake, fully alive, passionate, normal disciples for Him. What is it about the holiday season that gives you the greatest joy? Is it the time spent cutting down the family Christmas tree at the local farm? Or if you're south of the equator, maybe it's the time spent with friends under palm trees at the beach. Perhaps you find joy in contemplating the profound meaning of the carols that we sing. Or maybe Christmas joy for you is found in the spirit of giving that surrounds this season. As we reflect on these joys, let's always remember the great light who guides us, the source of joy and meaning in life, the loving Father who is at the heart of all treasured relationships, and the wonderful God who gave the ultimate gift in a newborn child. Some of my joy this season comes in part from your letters and emails, your prayers, and your faithful giving of support for this ministry, which literally reaches around the world. If you've been blessed this year, I'd like to ask you to join the many people who financially support Pioneer's Media Ministry, which brings you this program. It's simple to do. Just call our toll-free number, 877-HIS-WILL. One of our friendly operators will be happy to help you. You can also click the Donate link at the top of our website, pmchurch.org, and look for the Media Ministry option. Truly, no gift is too small for God to use to spread the good news of His love, His sacrifice, and His future plans for our happiness. 
Every gift is entirely invested in our mission to communicate God's good news to a generation who needs the hope found in Jesus, who alone can bring them true joy in life. Once again, our website is pmchurch.org. This season, know that our Pioneer family is praying for you and that our greatest wish is that Emmanuel, Jesus Christ in the flesh and in your heart will be at the center of the best memories made with your family and friends.